but it's a pleasure to be here. Um, very sad, of course, to be near the end of the development climate days, but uh, we'll try to make it the highlight that it usually is. Um, Sleep, any introductory words from you, or should we go straight to the panel? So, um, we have a, a wonderful panel, which um, we always call a high level panel, but it's partly high level in the sense that we elevate local experiences to the global discussions that we're having here these two weeks. So, not everyone in this panel is a minister, but all of their voices are important. Um, and we're very keen to hear a, a quick personal introduction from each of them, just uh, telling us who they are and uh, what brings them to the COP, but also development climate age in particular. Um, we'll just go right to that, if I may ask you to, to begin, just to pass the mic. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, colleagues. My name is Veronica Gundu Chakarasi. I'm from Zimbabwe. I'm the current Africa group negotiators coordinator for the mitigation. I'm also the climate manager um, for one of the development banks in Zimbabwe. So we are advancing climate work. I've worked also as the deputy director in the ministry uh, in the climate change management department. And I'm glad to be here to advance the climate work and see how we also work from different stakeholders and uh, how the communities are involved and no one is left behind. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon to all of you and thanks for welcoming us uh, here this afternoon. My name is Inge Vianen and I'm leading the uh, Global Platform for Climate Change and Resilience for CARE International. A big INGO working in 95 countries in the world. Uh, I came here yesterday, I arrived by train in Katowice after a long tra train journey from the Netherlands, but really very nice journey with beautiful views. And I'm here with a big team of colleagues from CARED who are lobbying and advocating for a fair and just implementation of the Paris Agreement. And we have had some disappointing news last night, of course, with this whole thing going about welcome and note and, and you know, to normal people you would wonder, well, what does this mean? Why, why this confusion about these words? But uh, we all know that this is quite important, actually. But let's not let ourselves be put down because of those kind of negotiations, because at the same time, this morning I received the news that 10,000 churches in Poland were actually praying for climate change justice and efforts towards climate change, and that is really encouraging. So thank you very much once again for being here. Hello, um, my name is Barney Dixon, and I have been given permission by the uh, moderators uh, to spend a couple of minutes on my introduction, because I want to explain, uh, tell you something about the Global Commission on Adaptation. So, my name is Barney Dixon. I am based at the new Global Centre on Adaptation in Rotterdam. And one of the main things we are doing with our partners uh, in, 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 in the US, uh, WRI, the World Resources Institute, is to support the new Global, Glo Global Commission on Adaptation. Um, the Global Commission on Adaptation was launched in uh, The Hague on the 16th of October. Uh, whose commission is it? Uh, it's not a UN commission. It is a commission which is called for by 17 convening countries. Uh, uh, the commission itself has a leadership of three. Those uh, uh, three co-chairs, if you like, of the, of the commission are Ban Ki-moon, the uh, uh, former Secretary General, Kristalina Georgieva, the CEO of the World Bank, and Bill Gates of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. In addition to them, there are uh, a, a further 23 other uh, commissioners representing a geographical and political uh, uh, diversity, uh, 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 many of them from government, but also we have representation from the private sector, from civil society, from some other international institutions. That is the uh, uh, basic structure of the uh, Commission. Uh, what does it intend to do? What is its objectives? Uh, I would say 
uh, say there are three main objectives. The Commission has three main objectives. One, to raise the profile of climate adaptation uh, at the highest level, to uh, make the case to uh, political leaders, economic leaders, finance leaders, civil society leaders, that now is the time to take adaptation very seriously indeed. So it's going to be making the case for adaptation. Secondly, it wants to make that case in a positive way. That uh, uh, adaptation now, uh, climate change impacts are upon us. Uh, it is in your interests, in your interests, in my interests, whoever you may be or I may be, to uh, take action to adapt to climate change. Uh, 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 and it, it, the Commission will make that case. The third thing it will do, and ultimately the, the, the test, the criterion of the success or failure of the uh, Commission will be whether it can, uh, as it uh, wishes to do, accelerate action, scale up action on climate change adaptation scale up action which meets the needs of the most vulnerable, uh, those who, uh, as uh, is often noted, but I think bears repeating, have typically done least to cause climate change. How will the Global Commission uh, achieve its objectives? Through two main things. One, it will produce a report a flagship report which will be on adaptation, which will be delivered to the UN Climate Summit in uh, September 2019, next year. And secondly, it will initiate a number of action tracks in specific areas to uh, 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 achieve ambitious, but we hope achievable uh, goals, which will really uh, help move the dial, if you like, on adaptation. Uh, those action tracks will be uh, led by uh, uh, a small number of, uh, as it were, global actors, uh, and um, uh, as I say, over, over a period which will extend actually beyond the life of the Commission itself, seek to bring together the constituently relevant coalition and constituencies to achieve those objectives. I'll stop there. Why I'm very pleased to be on this panel is to have a discussion about how we can engage with the community here, the, the, the organizations and initiatives represented in this room, how, we, how the Global Commission can engage with you, learn from you, uh, uh, and ensure that uh, uh, the Commission reflects the ex uh, experiences and needs which you uh, 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 represent. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Gabu Jember from Ethiopia, currently chairing uh, the LDC group, which is more than one billion people, most vulnerable people in the world. And the main purpose of me here is to learn from the proactive stakeholders, which I know the CDC days have been really a very useful uh, venue for meeting uh, stakeholders to exchange views, to learn each other. And I'm not here to tell you the, what, what has been happening in terms of fighting over words uh, in the negotiation area. But the key message here is what's happening in the negotiations and what's happening on the ground like this kind of forum is a bit detached. We negotiators are not aware what's happening on the ground. I've been great last time I was in San Francisco for the climate summit and when I came to this kind of forest, you see actors here and them throughout the world that are really engaged uh, proactively. So, uh, so we, we need to bridge what's in the negotiation with what's happening in the ground. Just to briefly uh, to just tell you about what happened yesterday. We are in a situation, in a climate crisis situation. At this point, we don't need any evidence to really justify the impact of 
climate change with an increase of one degree Celsius, which is happening now. We don't need any testimonies. We have been facing. There is no country which is immune from the current impact. The recent drought in Germany, Europe, and uh, the, f the fire in the West, the droughts, flood all over the world. In that situation, we are now questioning science. Even 1.5 is not a viable option, but we are very late to go below 1.5. So I think this would be a call for uh, really actors on the ground to be guided by the uh, report, the 1.5 report, which the good thing is it's achievable, but we need to move from business as usual. So in this regard, we need we all need to own it. Whether the argument take notes and welcome is there, that will remain in that negotiation space. But what matters is making use of this report in our day-to-day -day, uh, uh, working environment. Uh, with this, I would like to thank you for having me here. But the main purpose why I'm here is to uh, just uh, inform you about a new initiative uh, which is called List Developed Countries uh, Initiative for e Effective Adaptation and Resilience. This initiative has been initiated uh, for the last, it has been discussed for the last year and a half. It is LDC owned initiative which is led by LDCs. Uh, the, and the main reason why I've been uh, thinking of this kind of initiative that if you look at uh, the current uh, NDCs of countries, especially East of countries, most of them have been done by a kind of fly in, fly out consultants to fulfill prayer to Paris for to, to comply with the time requirement. If you look at in most of our countries, we haven't owned it because it's a process which requires capacity to analyze and integrate it into. Uh, development plans. So in this regard, especially the adaptation component is relatively not well uh, handled. So in this regard, what shall we do? One size fits for all cannot work in this regard. The, the gaps may vary from country to the country. So in this regard, how can we support? We should not re just identify these are the challenges. Instead, we need to use a bottom-up approach to look for what are the challenges across countries in terms of planning, in terms of resource mobilization, implementation, as well as reporting on adaptation and resilience. Uh, we have already done stock taking for the African LDCs and will continue for the Asia Pacific LDC countries. And this initiative has been presented to the LDC ministerial meeting, which was held a month ago in Addis Ababa, and we were given political guidance to launch this event here uh, tomorrow at uh, uh, 1.45 in the LDC coordination meeting. Uh, so it's going to be continued and uh, the outcome will be translated into a roadmap for actions that needs to be undertaken in the coming years. So I hope this will be an opportunity for this, the outcomes of this initiative to fit into UN Secretary General Summit, which is going to be held in September uh, uh, next year. So, with this, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Jagan Japagani. I'm the Under Secretary General for the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Cross Societies. Um, I currently work in Geneva, but uh, most of my time I have worked in the field. Uh, from the 20 years of my 25 years career, I have mostly been in the field. So I still like to introduce myself as a field guy, not as a labor guy. Um, first of all, I'd really like to thank both Salim and Martin for, for this invitation. And of course, all of you uh, for your energy and participation late this evening. Uh, you know, I've been there for two days and uh, such an enthusiastic participation late this evening on the second day. Why I'm here? <clears throat> the first thing is, it's great to be in a panel where the women are in majority, which generally doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> so this gives a hope that hopefully the chances of success are higher. When the women are leading, I think the, the chances
chances of success are higher and the sustaining the success is also higher. So that's one of the reasons I'm here. <laughs> so thank you, the, the, the women leader here on the panel. That's, this is really, really great. And of course, also in the audience. Now, I, I, when I was coming here and uh, my colleague was telling me that, Jagan, you will be talking to the, you will be preaching to the converted already here. So there's not much to be said here to convert anybody. Probably this is an opportunity for us to come together and show the boys in this in this important uh, important discussion negotiations here. As Nelson Mandela said, you know, you cannot expect a different reason by keep on doing the same thing. You keep on doing the same thing. You keep on negotiating the same thing. You keep on discussing exactly the same issue, conference after conference, and expect a different result. That's just not going to happen. So maybe those of us here in the room, and I'm sure many others in this, in, in this conference, who have understood the issue, who have understood the potential impact of what is possible. I think that's, that's, that's why I'm here. I think we have a great opportunity to, to change these big discussions that happens in Geneva, now here in Poland, or in New York. And a lot of times, these discussions focus on numbers. Even I was reading in the plane flying here today, the, the focus sheet is 1.5 or 2 or 3. Where the focus should be, it is behind that. Behind that are people. Behind that are people and the communities who would be affected by that. It's not about 1.5 or 2. It's about the, the people, the real life behind those numbers who are being affected by that. And I think the organization like us as Red Cross Recreation, and I'm sure the organization which you represent here, can bridge that gap between what happens globally, these big debates, and sometimes very complicated debates, complicated language, and translating those complicated language into reality in the community where people can understand and take real action on the ground. I think if we can make a small contribution to change that nature of the debate from number to the people, I think that will be a great success. That's why I'm here. I believe we can make a difference. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, my name is Michelle Winthrop. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I'm usually found at DNC days because most of the organizing organizations are friends of, of, of mine, personally and professionally. Um, I'm the climate change policy lead within the Department of Foreign Affairs of Ireland, um, and specifically I work within Irish Aid. Um, I, I sort of come here with many hats and no hat, I suppose. Um, I work for the Irish government. Um, during this COP, I have also been uh, EU uh, lead negotiator on national adaptation plans and LDC matters. Um, and I'm also a member of the Least Developed Countries Expert Group of the Convention. Um, I'd like to invite you all to take all of those hats off. So I'm here just as Michelle. <laughs> like everyone, I'm not going to be defending any EU positions. Um, I suppose why I'm here, why I'm enthusiastic about being part of this conversation is that I'm among my crowd. Um, I have worked for many years in development. I've worked for many years in Africa. I consider Ethiopia my second home. Um, and for the first time really this last week, I sat right in the negotiations. And for the first time ever, I properly cared about where the comma went. And, whether we were requesting or inviting and, and so on. And I'm still slightly in reflection mode about what that means and, and, and what really we've achieved. Um, but, but certainly I've learned so much about the divide between the negotiations process and reality. I guess I haven't fully processed it before. So I'm, I'm looking forward to this conversation. It'll help me reflect even further. It's a little bit like a therapy session, but thank you. I am Kosten Sokolai from Uganda. I am a peasant farmer. I am very glad that I am from the low level today I am at the from the low level today I am at the high level panel. So I am very glad about that. Um, my work I do, I am a, a peasant farmer. I have a small group called the Supreme United Women Network. This is a, a women network 
working on agriculture. They produce food to feed their families and some to sell for their home domestic needs. But as climate change, most of you know about it, came and destroyed all their plants and they are now just there seated doing nothing. They cannot do anything more about their lives. So we help them to talk about climate change because they didn't know about climate change. Now we tell them what climate change is. We tell them what to do. We tell them what next. We tell them not to have that bad heart because they were saying that it was God trying to punish them. It was God that makes them to reduce because people are many in the world. Now God is reducing by sending the rain, the, the floods come, kill them, the sunshine comes, long drought, people die of hunger, more so the children because the reason why they are saying family planning, when most children die, there is no next generation. So the next generation will not be there if this climate change continues. So that's why we came together. We say, no, let us have hope. All will be fine. So that is that. And now I came here all the way from Uganda after struggling with the visas, the work, and everything, the flight missing, again rescheduling. I'm now here. I'm very happy that I'm here to tell you about myself and to get the issues here to take back to my community. Unfortunately, when I take back the issues here, they always ask me, when are they coming to see us? When are they coming to bring us the alternative uh, projects, programs? Mm -hmm. Then we tell them, begin. They've already started. They want the funds for improving so that they can even get the next generation. They can even help themselves out of this climate change issues because if they have, they were on agriculture. Now the, the seasons are no longer there. And yet a season is a season. It remains a season. When the rains come in the middle of uh, maybe September, October, that is not the season. The season is August, July. Then the rains come in the middle of April. That is not the season. The season is February, March. So a season remains a season. What is the alternative? The alternative is small entrepreneurships. Have small businesses at household level. You get the money, pay school fees, get the money, buy uniforms, get the money, use for your domestic needs. But they ask, when are they sending us that money for that activity? We have already initiated. What are we to do now? They are talking. When will they stop talking and be implementing? The money comes, it ends somewhere. The money does not trickle down to the community. This is what I understand. I don't know whether it comes, but I understand it comes. But it ends somewhere. When it ends there, it doesn't come to the community. I am a community, but a community woman. When you look at me, Look at my woman. Look at the community down there. Don't look at, and that's why I'm saying I'm happy to be at the high level. And I will go back and tell them that I was put where? Up there. To represent you people. And they will be happy. You see? So, what we want, let things be done. Let those women, the women and the men and the children be supported to keep their lives because they are suffering. The impacts is their living and yet they are the major producers. They produce food, the little they get feeds the whole world. Thank you. Thank you, and, and it's hard to come after you, I have to say. <laughs>
So my name is Bernice uh, Van Bronckhorst. I'm the third Dutch person here, I think, today on the on, on, on the high floor. So there are probably many more in, in the audience. But um, um, I am um, very newly uh, director for climate change at the World Bank. And um, when I was uh, when I was just brief before asking about you know what am I doing here? Why am I here at this panel? I was just sort of thinking that my own personal journey probably somehow reflects the journey that the World Bank has taken in its thinking on, on climate change. So just, so just very briefly, I started out over 20 years ago working on urban development, participatory slum upgrading, and gender issues. I uh, worked for a decade in, in Latin America and the Caribbean, um, spent a lot of time living and working in Brazil, then worked on Central America, and then ended up working on Haiti. And, and it was really when, when I was working in Haiti, I guess it was the early 2000s, um, late 2000s, sorry, um, that I was first sort of confronted with you know, a major hurricane. So one of the cities that I was working in, Gonaive, in the north of Haiti, was completely devastated by you know, this massive hurricane and, and flood surge. So really heartbreaking. Um, a couple of years later, of course, there was a you know a massive earthquake in, in Porto Prince, and I was asked to lead the, the reconstruction, the post-disaster reconstruction of, of the housing program in, in, in Haiti. Um, and then shortly after that, I, I started working on, on South Asia. So within months of me arriving in South Asia, it was floods, it was cyclones. Um, I, I worked a lot of uh, on, on fragile and conflict affected countries. So my four years that I worked on Afghanistan, to my astonishment, more people died related to natural disasters than actually died because of the conflict, the acts of conflict in, in Afghanistan in those years. These are numbers that, that are kind of mind boggling. Um, and I think really turned me almost evangelical about how you have to do adaptation, you have to do climate resilient development. In whatever the project you do, whether it's transport, urban, health, education, um, and 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 that's as I say, I think that is kind of be my own personal journey. Um, I then ended up working the last few years uh, on the Africa region again, urban development, disasters management, um, and um, and I think the way that the World Bank is really trying to step up, step up on its ambition in in, in climate action. Um, putting particularly adaptation at parity with mitigation because to be perfectly honest it's very easy to get your mitigation co-benefit numbers up very quickly because these are a few large sort of renewable energy projects that kind of you know lift your numbers quickly. What is much more challenging is to get the adaptation numbers, to get the adaptation to happen at the community level. Um, and I think we are fully committed to this agenda. As I was saying in an earlier panel, the reason I'm here, the reason I got to be director of climate change is exactly because I just feel absolutely passionate about this. And I don't think there is any kind of development we can do without looking at the climate um, agenda in a completely integrated way. So looking forward to the discussion and, and thank you for having me here today. Set of introductions. Thank you all very much, and um, uh, what a wealth of experience. Um, also, interesting to see the differences in the world. Eh? I think the fact that someone, the director of climate change in the World Bank, comes from this experience is something we did not have seen ten years ago. So, I think this will be a, a very interesting conversation. I also want to remind us: um, Barney gave the introduction on the, the Global Commission on Adaptation. We've heard that the UN Secretary General is convening a climate summit in September. In some ways, I think both exist because we are failing. We are failing with the negotiating process here to reach the level of ambition that we need in light of all of these stories. And the question is how do we collectively, this community, but also us going out and bringing others along, use those moments to actually raise that level of ambition? I think that's our big question for this panel. It's also where we expect Barney, and your boss would have been here, for some reason he didn't show up. Um, I think it is important that he does come and listen to this community. Um, it is important that we take everything from what we've discussed in these two years, two days, and give it to you, make sure that it does get captured, get recognized. 
as an important component of that the solution space that needs to be lifted up. So I really appreciate that high level effort. Uh, but let's also make sure we get it right over the coming, coming year. And um, what, what I think we have in mind for, for the coming uh, hour or so is a discussion that on the one hand captures, not comprehensively, but at least some of the, the, the key things you're most passionate about from the last two days, and then also get the advice from this, uh, this set of experts on how we, uh, how we take it forward the coming year, including also the reflections from the likes of Barney of how we can help him also ensure that this all gets captured in those high-level processes. So um, I think we'll take you through the four themes of the, um, of the, the meeting. Um, I know some of you have been following one of these tracks. Um, in that case, you can also um, focus on, on one of these four and, and be more of a listener in the other ones. But what we'll ask you to do is, is for each of these themes, take a moment to reflect with a few people around you. This is where I had anticipated a room with circular tables, so this is definitely not a high-level panel that's just going to be preaching to you. Uh, we do want to imagine you to imagine that there are still round tables, or at least grab a little group around you. And, and take a few moments to discuss, um, maybe starting with the first theme, resilience through empowerment. What did you pick up these two days? What would you like to get across to these high-level processes? What would you like to get advice on as you take this forward from this panel. Um, and um, take a few moments with a couple of, of people around you, and then we'll, we'll take a few of them, uh, maybe three or four from across the audience, and then get a couple of people from this, this uh, fantastic panel to respond. So um, take a few moments for resilience through empowerment. What have you picked up from the last two days? What would you like to know from the panel? What would you like Barney to convey to his high-level commission adaptation? Okay, so show of hands, and I'll, I'll bring the microphone to you, and you can make your contribution. That's all right, I'll take it. Yeah. Yes. It's in there. disasters, we're moving into that this is caused by external forces and not caused by us. And I think we really, really have to be careful when we talk about climate change and the causality of human action. So, thank you. Good point, Colin. Anybody else? Yes? If you'd like to stand up and introduce yourself first.
Stephanie from the Red Cross. Um, I think one of the most powerful messages I got in the beginning was, I don't know if it was Salim, but it was like, we don't need to be empowered, we already have the power. Um, and I was wondering, uh, for the Global Commission or for the World Bank, we heard a lot of amazing examples from Constance, from Sheila these days, from Vijal, about how communities are taking the power and already developing solutions and how these solutions must be developed by the communities and by the poor communities. And I was wondering what space you will give uh, for this power in your institutions and the institutions you are creating. Thank you very much. Shall we uh, let the panelists uh, share their thoughts? that the World Bank is going to get a lot of questions. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm new to that. This is my first Comes time. with the therapy, Bernice. <laughs> you, you get the dollars, you get the questions. <laughs> <laughs> so let me just, um, just quickly on the, on the urban planning uh, question. So I, you know, I think it's fair to say that um, in pretty much all of our or certainly our slum upgrading projects, where we're directly working with communities to upgrade housing, upgrade community infrastructure, we absolutely always include a very strong participatory uh, component in that, because in fact the sustainability of the investment is totally dependent on the complete buy-in um, and, and, and support and enthusiasm of that community that you're trying to help. So I think again, many, many years of investments that have gone to waste, I guess, have and we've all learned that we absolutely need to put the community first, listen to their voices, and, 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 and really um, bring that into the design of the project. Now, specifically on, on, on resilience, I think there's some really interesting new things that are happening. We're working in a number of different countries, for example, the OpenStreetMap um, community, which is working with local community members, often youths, often young people, to do the risk mapping of their own community so we can get a much better sense of um, of where the climate risks, or you know, in, in many cases, they are climate-related disaster risks are, and to make and to use that information to both design interventions, hard infrastructure, some of the uh, nature-based solutions that we're looking at, but also to look at how can we incorporate that information in things like uh, making sure the community gets mobilized to, or you know, to clean up the drainage system right before the rainy season starts. So. It's a sort of a, a very dynamic way of looking at building resilience at the local level. Um, do we Thank do enough you. of it? Probably not, but we should. Great. Thank you very much, Bernice. Any, anybody else on the panel wish to uh, address this question or share your own little uh, huddle conversations? Yes, yes Gary. Maybe just to build on what you said, but also our madam from Uganda. I think I think you you highlighted that very very well already and uh, and you talked about coming from low level no you are not coming from the low level I think what you are doing is the highest that is possible <laughs> I think so so congratulations for, for, for what you are doing I think the, the, the local empowerment aspect here I think a, a, a huge shift is needed on the thinking I think a lot of times we are still talking about developing the tools, maybe in Washington or in Geneva, and bringing it to the community. It projects, a lot of our work so far, and one of the reasons they haven't been successful is because we are approaching it as projects. We run little projects in two or three villages, we write good evaluation, of course it's one of the three villages, we get a good outcome. But then we are not using these pilots to scale, to take it to a scale to thousands and thousands and villages of communities who are affected by that. So that big shift, moving from the piloting of the projects from a limited number of communities to take it to a scale, that then really makes an impact, first thing. The second thing is, what I have also seen also sometimes in my own organization, you know, of course we invest a lot on some of the centralized mapping, you know, or doing an assessment which takes two or three years to try to put all those things in place, and by the time we are ready with our tool, things have changed already. So that's why really empowering the local community, meaning that developing the tools, and we have some tools that we develop by Red Cross, if the communities can develop those tools themselves, they can they update them regularly. And then the role of organizations like us should be to accompany them in that process. 
and, and, and sometimes bringing the knowledge, uh, the sharing of the knowledge, sharing of the good practices, but really putting them at the center. A lot of time, I think it's talked about a lot, but not practice enough. So I think we really need to change the talk to practice. Yes. And I saw one of that in those uh, uh, diagrams there. Mm -hmm. A lot of practice coming from you, change from talk practice. Absolutely, great. Thank you very much. Anyone else on the panel? Good group, please. Maybe uh, briefly on transparency and downward accountability. Um, there are figures that out of the global climate finance, nearly 18% is reaching to least third countries, almost the most vulnerable ones. And out of that, only 10% is reaching to the local communities. Uh, there are issues, I mean, the way we channel resources. In the interim, there are a number of layers which will take the majority of the resources. And at the same time, the approach that we are following also matters. Unless we move out, of, uh, out from project-based management to pro programmatic approach, if it's a project, it's area and time limited. In that case, it's going to be difficult to cover a wider area. But if we integrate it into our development plans, one, the money will go direct to the communities, uh, which will avoid the transaction costs in from federal, regional, whatever. So in that case, it will improve the uh, accessibility of resources to the wider, to the community and the ground level. Uh, when it comes to transparency, I think uh, just if I share with you uh, Ethiopian experience, uh, we started with low carbon climate resilient development strategy uh, ten years, nine years ago. At that point, we don't know what we are doing. Um, it's just learning by doing. We have the strategy, then what? Oh, we need to have uh, a mechanism for operationalizing the strategy. We develop that. Then, why don't we do kind of fast track projects? We done the projects. But that's an expensive way of learning. But now there's lots of lessons which we can share among ourselves. Then, Oh, we need to move to from project-based to integration approach. We, we integrate to our development plan. Then, in terms of, like, we were having a goal, three goals. Instead of development goal, we have climate mitigation goal, resilience goal. Three goals in place, so, but integrated. But when you set a goal for a given sector, it's at national level. Then regions were asking, what's my share? That takes us for the development of an MRV system in place. To set the baseline at different layers. That helps us also to set targets and then see the overall impact. So we are learning by doing, but uh, this transparency, especially from an adaptation perspective, I think more work needs to be done. Still, we don't have a global goal for adaptation. Thank you. I just want to go back to the question about empowerment that, that you raised and how committed we are. I mean, as you know, Constance is very empowered, possibly the most empowered person I've ever met in my life. But I think, you know, if you think of the bigger picture and, and the urgent need that we have to speak truth to power, if you like, we need a hundred Constances, we need a thousand Constances, we need ten thousand Constances, and we also need to fundamentally change the system so that you know, it's, it's not difficult to get Constance to a cop. It's not difficult to, you know, provide that support and, and, and logistics and so on. And, and certainly, from, from the Irish perspective anyway, we're, we're open for all suggestions of practitioners and, and organizations working on the ground who are able to help identify people with a story to tell that can really influence the wider picture and who are able to provide that support and book the flights and sort out the visas and all of that painful stuff. And if we had that kind of mechanism, then we're in a much stronger position to be able to say, for example, to the UNFCCC, listen, just listen, you know? Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, Barney, do you want to? Yeah. I did sort of notice you encouraging questions to the Global Commission, and that's entirely right and proper. You know, we should be, to use 
use the expression used earlier, our feet should be held to the uh, fire. And um, so let me try and respond to some of the issues that have been raised very quickly. First of all, if the commission is to be successful, then what it recommends as needed, the recommendations as to what is needed in order to accelerate action, to scale up action on adaptation, need to be informed. And one thing that is, one area where they need to be really informed about is successful grassroots action. And I absolutely take the point, and the, 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 there are very good reasons why those who are on the one hand the poorest and most vulnerable are also sometimes the most innovative and creative with their extremely limited resources in coming up with uh, effective solutions. It's because their lives are at stake, their incomes are at stake, their health is at stake. There are very good reasons why people in that situation have to be creative and innovative. So the Commission needs to be able to draw on those lessons to learn. But also, and I think this speaks a bit to Michelle's point, we also need to know what are the barriers. What is it that's preventing that those kind of solutions being adopted at scale? On, uh, 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 in, in a widespread way. So we need that, and we, you know, you are one resource, the people and organizations in this room are one resource that can help us get there. Secondly, what is, we need to, the Commission needs to think about what is the process by which you can convey those messages to us. I don't, and, and this is where it gets a little bit more kind of practical, I want to actually talk about some of the things we are trying to do. So, the issue of, you know, there's all this money up there in the Green Climate Fund and, blah, 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 and other international funds and bilateral donors, not so much of it seems to get down to the ground to the people who need new. So, well, one thing we are doing, we are working with the uh, 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 African Adaptation Initiative and researchers in South Africa to write a, a paper for us on the missing middle. What is it that's stopping that money getting from up there to down there? Uh, we are also commissioning other work on issues directly of interest to this community. But we're also seeking to uh, work with, indeed, to work with some of the organizations represented and some of the organizers, indeed, of, of, of DNC days to see if we can develop processes of consultation and dialogue to ensure that these messages are, um, uh, 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 do inform the work of the of the Commission. It's not easy. It's not easy to do this. We've got a very tight time frame, but um, uh, we, uh, and we will need your support. But um, uh, certainly I think we can, my message will be, are committed to try to address this. Thank you. Great, yes. Um, so thank you all, and uh, to those who've not contributed in this round, um, feel free to also continue to reflect on the earlier themes in, in the next round. Um, let's take a few moments uh, for you to reflect on the second theme, valuing lived experience and local knowledge. Sarah Diefendor of PFC West, um, we were told to speak truth to power, and so I'm hearing, sorry to pick on you about your permission, but I'm hearing about a report Two reports now, a report as to why, um, about adaptation, another report as to why the money never gets down to the people at the ground. Um, I think a lot of people already know why the money never gets down to the people at the ground. And I'm also hearing scale, and for me, that's almost, that, that's the simple answer you're looking for. What happens if Constance's village is different from the village next door to her? and the villages in the country next door to her country, and the villages across continents, they're all different. They're all trying to survive adaptation in a different way because they have different circumstances. And it feels as though we're looking for this straight, simple answer from the high level instead of, I don't know, Constance, what would you do? 
with a hundred with thousand euros to adapt. <laughs> It's so interesting, that's why I'm laughing. <laughs> Let me just give you a story. Last year when I was uh, in Bonn, I spoke my story and the director of climate, Global Climate Fund gave us $5,000. We changed that money to Uganda shillings that was 17 million. What did 17 million do? 17 million bought plows, ox plows, and some horse. And this is a life of a Ugandan woman. Because out of that, we are getting the food. Mm -hmm. Then we gave it to the groups. After giving the groups, I tell you what, the food that that group has, they still have food up to now. Yet others don't have food. Why? Because there was early opening, early weeding, and harvesting, catching up with the season. Mm -hmm. Because if you use a hoe, it makes it very difficult. Hoe today, tomorrow, it's the opening, the land takes like one month to open one acre. But two days to open an acre with the plow. That's why they say, no, we don't want anything, we don't want that money. You buy for us uh, the plows and ox plows the food they have. These people without the ox plow, they don't have the food. And that's why I'm saying the whole world will change. With the 100,000 euros, you will find things changing. My community will be the richest. They will, they will not even say what's next. Because they will have the food, they will have the money, they will have the business, they will be having everything they want at their fingertips. In school fees they will pay. Because out of the plows they are using now, they are now using the plow to, as an income to the group. And they, get, they do the savings and credit to get money and pay their school fees. They don't even go to the banks to borrow money as they used to for school fees. There shall be no school group ups. I count what and leave what. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Any other contributions on this line? Local knowledge? Yes, at the back. Would you like to come up a little bit? Meet me halfway? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I think her contribution reminds me, um, I'm Edith Ofwana from IDRC. Her contribution reminds me of the challenge that Salim posed to us, I think when uh, ANC Day started yesterday, where you say, let the negotiators talk, but we are here to act. And I think she's given a practical example of how money can make a change. So I have a challenging question for Veronica. As a negotiator, how can you respond to the issue that she has raised? How do you connect the negotiations, the policy processes, and actually bring action at the ground level? Good question. Uh, thank you very much, Ethan. Uh, I think that's a very good question. We already have uh, negotiations on finance and there's this flaw that the Africa group is blocking the negotiations on finance, but I don't think it's true. Um, we're trying to get a balanced package um, for something that is relevant for the African continent. Um, we have the Green Climate Fund, we have the Global Environmental Facility. It has been financing different climate uh, actions. And part of the financing, maybe that's why she was saying, some of the money doesn't get to the ground. Because when the money comes, some of it is already bracketed for its use. We want a document on the feasibility analysis of this particular area. We spend two million. The other money comes and it's bracketed. We spend another one million. But for her, she only needs $5,000 to change her lifestyle. So what we are saying is 
let us um, get a full package where we can get resources that are structured to both address policy level needs and also address community level needs. And that will be a full package. And the other issue is the issue of capacity building. For me to draft and develop a full proposal that can be submitted to the Green Climate Fund, it's a process. Where do I get that capacity? And you realize that I'll probably need about $300,000 to put a GCF proposal together because I need to understand what type of irrigation do they need. They need integrated irrigation system. How does it look like? Why has the previous irrigation system failed? So what do? So th those are the real issues that matter. And we're saying, what is the role of the actual public financing system? And what is the role of the private sector? And what is the role of the non-state actor? And where is the blending financing coming in? It goes back to the issues of scaling up. What are you scaling up? Where has the best practice been done? Where is the platform where we bring all those people together and the person who is with an unstater or with a philanthropic will say, I've been working with this community. They're into tomato production. They've done this irrigation. If you come in as a private sector and you provide this type of financing or you draft this type of a product, it will be relevant to enable them to scale up and develop their lifestyles and get into entrepreneurship and become sustainable. So as the negotiators, I think what is very fundamental is to say, um, how best can we structure the guidance that is relevant not only for policy makers, but also for everyone else, and even to give hope, because right now we are talking of um, financing, the World Bank has already put 200 billion. That is already sending a signal to the private sector in terms of climate financing. And then you're also saying to the public sector, how much more can you do? And when you're looking, I think we're also going to be talking about financing adaptation. The other time, my honorable minister said, Veronica, you're busy talking about this GCF. When is it coming? But we are doing a lot already for our communities. Who is documenting for us? Who is telling our story? So this is, these are the real issues. And um, so as the negotiators, we are trying our best. I'm negotiating mitigation. I'm trying my best to make sure that we get a guidance that is relevant and that will send a signal to both the parties and the non-state actors. And for adaptation, we are saying, what is it that you're going to be communicating? What is it that you're going to do to say, indeed, we are moving towards the adaptation goal? Indeed, we have captured, and these are the fundamental indicators that we're going to be using to create a baseline that is relevant, that will build on and say, adaptation is getting the communities are getting adaptive and we are improving and we are moving towards resilience so those are the real issues that we are looking at as we continue to negotiate thank, thank you. you very much Veronica, for that excellent presentation. my name is prince and from ghana university of ghana and with my experience on the field working with local people community people through research and what we call research to use in our projects. What I realized is that most times, at the community level, it's good to get the money to the local uh, level. But I also realized that it becomes, um, the local people become conscious of what project means. What project means to them is they are bringing you money. Every project is coming with money. So even when you try to mobilize people, for an accident, they expect you to give them money. They expect you to, to give something before they respond to what you want to do. And that is very difficult, especially at the local level. So my question to uh, Ms. Mrs. <laughs> Constance, yes, is how do we let local communities have uh, show responsibility and ownership of the situation at hand so that they can also um, because in your case, you are, you are lucky to get 5,000 to support um, your group, but in other cases, they, they have nothing. So in, how do we uh, um, let local people own the situation and do something you know, on their own, whether it's contributing to solve uh, uh, problems within their communities or... Yeah, so that's, that's the thing. Thank you. Thank you. 
Should we take one or two more? And yeah, one. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's take more. Sorry, yes. Thank you. My name is Lucy from Tanzania. I wanted to address my comments to uh, the representative of the commission that the missing middle is decentralized private finance. That is where you can channel finance from the global or national level to the communities. And this uh, mechanism now is working in uh, four countries and many countries are also have shown interest of adopting this, because this is where you have almost 90% of the funding uh, doing actual projects on the ground, prioritized by the people, and the 10% which is used for operation includes the operation of the local communities. So that is the missing middle. Thank you. Yes the issue of that young man. The reason why these people don't want you people to, to get their information or without paying them is you, there's a group of people who go to school to get uh, degrees, masters, and at the end of the day, they use that to get money out of the poor. And they use it, they used to buy big vehicles, build the houses in town. And that's why when you come down, they will not allow, because they know that you people get the information and go, and you don't come back and bring, after doing your research and whatever. So they, they say, our knowledge, no. Most, in my community, most people have done that, they come, get the, the, the information about, they, those people are clever, they have every information that you want, they have it. But these people use them to get the information, to get rich, that's why they don't want. And it's not only in Uganda, it is everywhere, they know it. Eh? So I think if you are the type of that person who wants to do that, stop it. Be telling money and take it to them. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just have a two-hander on this question because I actually also think that, you know, the development agencies and the NGOs on the ground are often the worst, you know, we, we set this up ourselves. And I'll give, I'll give a very simple example. I mean, again, my many years in Haiti, there were all these cash for work programs that were, you know, going into desperately poor communities to get them to clean the drainage time and again. So every time before a hurricane or before rainy season, there would be money handed out for the local communities to, to, to clean up the drainage uh, ditches. And then afterwards, there'd be a lot of hand wringing, like how come every time these drainage ditches are full of solid waste again? And it's like, we've set up the perverse incentive for communities who are desperately poor, who need money. Um, so of course they're gonna sit back and wait for you know someone to come in and, and pay them to do these kinds of things. So again, I think sometimes we need to look at our own the way we behave, the way we incentivize um, communities to 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 allow for this kind of action to take place without necessarily paying for it. So. Yes. Well, first of all, just to uh, clarify one thing. I, I'm sorry, I did not mean to. In suggest there were two reports. There is one report from the Global Commission. Uh, it will be informed, the report will be developed on the, will be informed by a lot of background papers that we are commissioning. One of those background papers was on that particular issue about the, the missing middle and you, I think you suggested you know what the missing middle is. Or, or, and, 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 the, and the colleague, I think, from Tanzania, uh, well, it would be great to connect with you and we could maybe even, you know, if you, if you, uh, 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 you know, have some, something that you can feed into that and inform that paper, then we can connect you with the relevant people. So that would be good. I mean, the finance, the finance thing is, uh, you know, I'm not a finance expert, and, but it is clear. <laughs> We will be, the, 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 the Commission's report will be, include an important chapter on finance, but it is not just about finance. Uh, we will be addressing issues on 
the use of social protection measures, which the incentives need to be right, otherwise you just create incentives to uh, not address the, the, the challenge in, a, in, a, in an ongoing way, but just to repeat the cycle in the time. We'll be looking at nature-based solutions, we will be looking at uh, uh, the role of uh, a community-based adaptation. So, uh, uh, insofar as we can address the broad swathe of important issues on adaptation, we will do so in the uh, report. And we need your insights and views. And, uh, uh, and uh, I hope we can have the, the, develop the, the means to ensure that we can um, uh, draw on your insights. Thank you. Yes, and I think we're running out of time, and we do want to let you go to uh, the breaking time. We'll, we'll give you an opportunity to uh, to give a first reflection now, and then, uh, but I'll so that I don't speak twice. I'll just ask after we've heard, um, take the last two themes in one round, and we'll do one more round with a few reflections from you. Go back to the panel one more time. But uh, Ina, first a uh, few reflections on the previous. Ah, okay. Yes. Thanks. Um, so I'm looking forward to the report and uh, also to the process in which we can input, of course, as uh, research institutions and NGOs. Um, in that sense, it might also be interesting to know for the Global Commission on Adaptation that CARE is actually in the process of developing a methodology that, uh, um, with which we can actually track finance, climate adaptation finance. Uh, because, as many of you have mentioned, uh, first of all, there's not enough money coming through on adaptation finance, but second of all, there seems to be an over-reporting of climate adaptation finance. So we really want to see where is this money actually going, and we're going to track it down all the way to the roots, to the ground. And we're going to do that, uh, first of all, in six countries. We're going to test that methodology in six countries, and we want to make it as such that civil society organizations throughout the world can actually use this methodology to see where the money is flowing to and whether it's actually going to benefit the poorest people because of course as a development organization we want finance for adaptation to go to the most vulnerable uh, and, and poorest people uh, in the world and at this moment we are not seeing that happening. Uh, then just a short reflection on uh, valuing the lived experience and local knowledge as CARE, what we are seeing is that uh, communities often have a lot of knowledge on how to adapt to climate change, but in certain spaces they also lack knowledge. Uh, for example, last March I was in India visiting our climate adaptation program uh, over there in a rural area, and uh, the local people had uh, experienced that traditional seed varieties actually are much more climate resilient than new varieties. So we have started to create seed banks with them, at this moment, they are using these new varieties, or these new traditional varieties, so to say. But and that was actually uh, not the most difficult task. But one of the difficult tasks was to uh, then uh, ask people to adopt a new model of producing rice in their fields. And this was a model where they had to use five percent of their land uh, to actually use that, that not for rice but for catching water. And by doing that our experts were saying that the production would go up. But of course, if you're really poor, to give up 5% of your land, that's quite a risk to take. And we found some very courageous women who did this first. And what was very interesting to see is that when these women started to do that, and the production in their fields were, was increasing, the men actually would start to adopt and follow that methodology. So that was a very interesting experience for us to see, and also a mix of using local knowledge together with new knowledge added to it. Thank you. Shall we go to the, uh, to the floor again? We've got uh, a few minutes to discuss both the, the last two points. Yeah. We've actually done finance a little bit earlier, but let's, we can do it again. Um. Let me just read out the final two, because that might be one of the questions you would have, uh, given that not everyone might have the program at hand. So the one that last is transparency and downward accountability. And the last one is financing adaptation and managing risk. There's another question there. Just questions at this point. There are no remarks. We'll do a round of. Um... I'm Manoj Pariyar from ID in Nepal. Actually, my question is for the commission, uh, you know, representative here. You have mentioned that uh, you are looking for some, you know, climate actions and uh, 
400, we are looking for some best practices. But I think there is a lot of evidence and a lot of actions are there. Uh, if you have seen the presentation, so you can get the uh, last two days, there are a lot of things that are happening and uh, solutions are there. What is really important is scaling this, how to take it forward and probably documenting these races, the best practices. So I think uh, that would be a great move from the Commission actually to take forward these experiences to countries like Nepal, least developing countries, developing countries. Thank you very much. Let, let's give let, let's let's give a or should we do a round of no reflection to remind ourselves. If you have questions, let's use the back of that. Good. Uh, thank you, Chef Noah, German Development Institute. Um, my question goes to the negotiators on the panel and uh, relates to the Global uh, Adaptation Commission. And I would like um, the negotiators to answer what they are looking for from the report of the Global Adaptation Commission that will actually help them move the adaptation negotiations forward because judging by the experience of the 1.5 Special Report, the Commission may produce a very nice report and that's not even welcome, but rather not. Hi, my name is Kai Kim and I'm an independent consultant. My question is for the representative from the World Bank. So, um, during one of the sessions, we heard about how country, countries are experimenting with uh, private sector, public uh, partnerships, and mobilizing funds um, for ecosystem based solutions. And I would like to know. Um, to what extent the World Bank has thought about how they can scale that level of uh, um, resource mobilization at a national level to regional level, uh, and what the role of the bank would be in, that, in, in this context. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mustafa Rahman. I work for United Nations Environment Program. My question is basically the follow-up that Garvita, you have mentioned in terms of accessing the climate finance. It requires a lot of assessment to justify that the impacts that the project is going to address is the climate-related problem. Now, if we look into all the, the requirement in any climate finance instrument developed, obviously that is one of the requirements. On the other hand, if we look into the science, science is already telling us that impact is happening. But none of those instrument is recognizing to address both the current impact, which is very clear that the climate attribution is already there, and also addressing the future one. And this is related to what you mentioned, that if we continue the similar way, if we don't bring the changes, we're not able to address. So my proposal or the question is, you as a negotiator, are you going to change the, the criteria to access the climate finance, which will address both the impact is already happening and attribution is very clear, and the future attribution of the climate change. But the current instrument is talking about only the future. Uh, thank you, Katie Peters from ODI. Um, by 2030, 80% of the world's forests will be living in fragile and conflict affected contexts, and that is where climate vulnerabilities are highest. But the eligibility criteria for climate finance, it largely dissuades for access and use in contexts where institutional performance is low. So my question to the panel is, do you have any recommendations for us on how we can find both politically palatable and constructive ways to raise this issue of climate and conflict vulnerability? Perhaps, for example, in the UN Climate Summit next year. There was one last one at the back, and then the fifth across the first one. Thank you. My name is Lina Kuhlmann. I work at GSF, the German Development Corporation Agency. I have one question to Barney Dixon um, regarding the flagship report. You mentioned making the case for adaptation, and I was wondering if you could outline further if you will go to the economic argumentation in terms of taking action versus non-action and the quantifying the benefits of adaptation for crowding in the private sector. This would be very interesting. Let's make that the last one and then we can come to the panel. 
uh, David Halfenberg was in his partnership. I really want to pick up what Constance was saying because the last time we met in the Global Action Summit, uh, I was talking about the $5,000, but the previous meeting, I've been at the Bank of America uh, talking around with uh, people talking about $90 billion of assets. And so I think the, the key thing is not climate finance, is how do we package you know, the $5,000 into you know, millions of dollars, which we can then be selling to the private sector investors, and we ask the World Bank and IFCs to use their finance to believe that open. So, I keep getting worried that we are booked on climate finance when there's a lot bigger pot of money out there which we should be accessing for farmers like Constance and, and, and uh, people in our village. Thank you very much. Should we uh, come back to the panel and let the panelists decide? Okay. Should we just go around? Uh, Veronica, you want to start? Yes. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, to the last speaker in terms of should we then package uh, community finance uh, we already have lessons. I think the Global Environmental Facility has put, provided a small grants uh, program initiative. And in Zimbabwe, it is really done well. We have a lot of um, good case studies, um, including where communities have done a lot of uh, fisheries and aquaculture. And they have been exporting. They've done uh, honey production. Um, and they've had an international standard for their honey and their able to export. So if we can have such an initiative even under the Green Climate Fund, where the communities can then also access that financing directly for program and project implementation, that would be very useful. And then to the colleague um, on the current and uh, future uh, climate change, I think it's very fundamental and it's one of the issues which probably contributes to the guidance to continuously change as we reviewed uh, based on what is happening and the best practice. Although for the parties, sometimes it becomes cumbersome because they start complaining that the GCF guidance keeps on changing and so you're not going to doing your GCF, the next thing you submit, they say, no, we have a guidance, use the new guidance. <laughs> so it's, it's one of those issues, but they'll be also trying to come up uh, with a, a guidance and a concept uh, proposal a structure that is relevant uh, to you um, to address the current and the future scenarios. And then, of course, um, the other colleague, um, I think, highlighted the issue around uh, private sector financing. Um, it is indeed a very fundamental issue, and I think it goes back to how do we uh, structure innovative financing, including giving confidence to the private sector. And, um, you have a lot of initiatives that are currently going on where parties are talking about hybrid financing and blended financing, and we are saying what is the role. And then of the 90 billion versus the 5,000, how do we then get to manage? Because if you look at infrastructure resilience, it, those are huge projects and they require a lot of resources and you cannot do them with $5,000. So how do you get the communities to do the $5,000 and create that resilience in their communities, but also get connected to the value chain uh, in, through the actual larger sustainable infrastructure resilient uh, programs, including your infrastructure, including your systems, and your access as well. So that, that, I think that is the more integrated type of approach when you're looking at the paradigm shift of climate financing and of building resilience, as well as moving towards sustainable development. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Uh, one of the things that uh, I was missing today in the conversations that we've had is when we talk about uh, increasing or strengthening resilience of poor and vulnerable communities, we tend to talk a lot about technical skills, uh, about climate information services, about technical skills to increase the production in the fields, but we are not talking so much about capacities <coughs> for people to actually transform the systems in which they live, the political systems, the social systems, to work towards more gender equality, for example, uh, to create skills for advocacy, lobbying, and uh, these are some of the things that I wanted to also mention because I think that if you create, if you want to strengthen resilience of communities, it's not only about technical skills, it's also about the more soft skills of advocacy and even, even uh, the building of confidence. We have some very nice examples uh, of some of our projects where we started to work with groups of women who were gathered in the village savings and loans associations. Women that had actually never been 
really able to voice out their concerns in the communities or even at a higher level of municipalities. And after some years of working together and strengthening their self-confidence, they actually engaged in policy debates. And I found that really encouraging to see that because it really means that now themselves, they themselves are actually transforming the systems and structures that they live in. That's something that I wanted to mention because we have not spoken so much about it, but I think it's equally important when we talk about resilience. Thank you very much. Uh, I think there are a couple of questions which are directed, direct, aimed directly at me. Uh, the colleague from uh, Nepal, if I understood you correctly, I, my response is I could not agree more. Uh, uh, as I understood you saying, yes, there are effective examples of uh, a good adaptation. The issue is how do we scale them up? How do we accelerate them? And that is, I hope, is a, is a question exactly that the that the commission will be will, will 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 address that it will seek to build on knowledge and understanding of effective solutions and point the way forward for how to scale up and and and, and, and accelerate. Um, there was a specific question about uh, 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 sort of climate and security in the in, 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 in the UN climate summit. As you may know, uh, there are six themes for the summit. Uh, one of those themes is resilience. The United Kingdom has been asked to um, uh, 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 lead on that uh, in some way on, on, on the resilience theme. If you were in the UK pavilion a couple of days ago, you would have heard the UK minister saying for the UK they regard uh, res this, this, this linkage and these connections with uh, uh, security issues as um, uh, 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 an important element in the picture. And, uh, I think that the issue will be is how that gets framed within the summit. And I think we need to be clear that we are talking about everybody's security, especially those of the most vulnerable, uh, not some other subset of... Well, I'll, I'll leave that at that. There's a question from the uh, from GIZ or uh, uh, DIE, uh, uh, from Germany, <laughs> about the, um, uh, yes, absolutely, part of the case, the case for uh, uh, ad adaptation is an economic case, I say part of it, it's not the whole story, and part of that case is about looking at the, you know, the cost of inaction, versus the costs of action. Uh, and often that will show that you know, the costs of inaction turn out to be greater than the costs of action. That doesn't, in itself, that doesn't necessarily mean that the action will happen. It depends on who's bearing those costs and who's benefiting from the expenditures if they happen. So we need the, the right economic and financial instruments to ensure that the, it is possible to, that we can move from having a sort of theoretical positive case for adaptation to devising the right instruments and mechanisms to ensure that it then uh, 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 becomes in, our, in, 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 in the interests of those who have the money to invest in that adaptation. And finally, just to, I just want to, we've talked quite a lot about the report and maybe, and, and indeed, but let me go back to my opening. The, the commission is not just about the report, it is about initiating action. It is, will be uh, uh, initiating a number of action tracks. There are, these action tracks are just in the process of development. Uh, uh, we have potentially, we have, the, the final list has not been settled. I list and several potential action tracks of interest to this audience, a potential action track on social protection, a potential action track on uh, the importance of, 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 of local action, a potential action track on um, uh, extremes and how to prevent extremes turning into disasters, um, input on which of those you know, we should be adopting, how they should be framed, uh, uh, will be very important and, and valued over the next few months, and what the objectives should be of those actions. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, 
uh, respond to one of the questions. Are you going to take note of this report? Uh, I think, uh, I believe this report will not come back to negotiators. Again, the same will happen like last night. But uh, the main reason why uh, this UN Secretary General Summit was held was at the request of the disturbed countries uh, there is, during the Talanoa technical phase last year, because we feel that it should not be kind of talk show. Uh, when the technical phase ends, there needs to be a uh, strong decision to be in place so that the political phase can start here during the COP, but the UN Secretary General needs to take it to the leaders' level. And a special summit needs to be held so that leaders will understand where we are right now in terms of our pledge, uh, previous pledge, previous Paris, and we want to achieve 1.5, then okay, how can we reach there? So, it's going to be kind of take home assignment for leaders uh, so that they will consider in their planning. So it should not be limited to mitigation. From Ellis' perspective, there's no clear boundary between development, adaptation, and mitigation. Each has its own core benefits. So in this regard, uh, this uh, commissioner's initiative on residence will contribute because achieving 1.5 through mitigation activities alone will be very expensive because uh, still more work needs to be done on building residence to the communities. And if you don't act now, it's going to be very expensive. So in this regard, it's scaling out, which we are expecting as a result of that summit. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when we talk on the financing, I think the, the lot of the financing mechanism that exists, including the, the, the climate financing, a lot of times they seem to be driven by, and many donors actually quite open to talk about value of the money. That seems to be the big motivation. And I think we fundamentally need to change that from value for money to value for people. And I think if we can change that perspective from value for money to value for people, I think some of these bureaucracies you were talking about, Madam, would hopefully <laughs> become become easier. I think that's that's where the focus should be. I think from the from from, from the perspective of the organization like uh, the important thing, both around the accountability but also the financing would be, you know, we need to continue to focus on the most vulnerable, the, the people who are actually the communities and the people who are most vulnerable by climate change, but also compounded many, many other events, including, including conflicts. The, the second element there would be, you know, the, the, the financing should be available for innovations innovations which could be used at the household levels and at the community level. Sometimes some of these very expensive uh, initiatives come in which cannot be used at the community level, at the household levels, like this community in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in Uganda. So investment on the innovations that can be used at household levels and the community level would be extremely important. And of course for us in, in the Red Cross, more than 50% of our, our response uh, to, to disaster and crisis are linked to weather extremes. Uh, Events, huh? the, the, the disasters, the, the weather the disasters. So this continues to be a big investment on response because we haven't invested enough on, 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 on adaptation and, and mitigation. So this continues to remain a, a, a big priority. And maybe my final point on, on the questions on the on, on the conflict and, and financing. I, I really don't have an answer, but just want to emphasize this point that we have clearly seen that the, the conflict exasperates the climate uh, situation and the climate change can also become the reason for the conflict. So there is this really uh, in, interrelated relationship there. And clearly, currently, in the donor community, majority of the donor community, the, the appetite for risk-taking or risk-sharing doesn't exist. So I think there is an expectation that the organization can go to this situation and function and take all the risks by themselves is simply unrealistic. So I think World Bank is here on the table, but I think many other donors need to realize that if we want to make a real difference, there will have to be a risk sharing uh, between the organizations, the communities, and the donor community and the donor governments. Otherwise, the situation there will only get worse. So I'm just putting my voice to your question, but uh, really not answering it because I really don't know the answer. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Um, before I respond to a couple of questions, I, I, I do have a burning issue that I want to raise. Um, we talk about finance, um, and yes, you know, we can talk about uh, adaptation, mitigation, effectiveness of, of the mechanisms and so on, but really there's one issue that we haven't mentioned, and that is 
reflecting the needs and circumstances of men and women equally through climate finance. And, and really, uh, you know, I've, we've been shouting a lot about gender this year as Ireland, and, and the conversation just keeps coming back to the fact that we're still making the, still making the case for women's roles in climate change to be reflected. And it's not being borne out in the finance. We're not getting to a figure that I would like us to aim for, which is 100% of climate finance addressing gender issues. Evidence from care and others suggests that we're not we're miles away. In fact, we're going backwards. So that if there's one plea I would make on climate finance is, God, give us a break. <laughs> give us a seat at the table. Give us a voice. Let people like Constance really just take it forward. So that's my burning issue. I've got that off my chest. <laughs> The, the point about uh, conflict and fragility is a really, really important one, and it's one as Ireland we're really worrying about. There's lots of discussion about the Security Council reflecting the relationship between climate and security and so on. Really, we need to start thinking about the practice at field level. Now, I know Red Cross, Red Crescent are a fantastic example of how you can address climate adaptation in the most intractable conflicts. But to be honest, the, the wider humanitarian and conflict practice and, and, and disciplines aren't thinking about climate change as much as we would like. And I, th I think really those that are working at the, at the absolute front lines need to debunk this narrative of, well, we'll wait till the war is over and then we'll address climate adaptation. Because many of these places are going backwards, if anything. Um, and then the, the last point I would raise, um, and I'm sorry to be a little bit controversial, you asked what the negotiators want out of the Global Commission for Adaptation. and, and I'm also um, very conscious, I won't say this is not on behalf of the European Union, just to be clear. <laughs> I'd like to reflect that you know the adaptation space does seem a little stale at the moment. And we are slightly going in circles, and there are lots of mechanisms and lots, lots of strands of discussion, communities of practice, and so on. And I think if anything we want out of the Commission, it's to shake it up a bit. You know, shake us out of our out of our sleep a little bit. Now I know we had hoped that for the IPCC report and maybe next week we'll, we'll generate that but, but I do think we need something new. We need some new messages, we need some new challenges because uh, to be honest, to be frank, with respect, if it just produces some more tracks of action, some more studies, it won't make a difference. So the challenge I put to you is, you know, wake us up, shake us a little um, and, and that would be welcome. Thank you. Thank you. When we talk about finance, uh, the only problem here we have, us as the community people, when they go to the issue, they want to finance a project, but the issue is, is proposal writing. They give very hard questions, very technical English. <laughs> you cannot understand what it is. At the end of the day, you just put it, put it aside. So you fail to get the money because of the of the, the 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 language in the paper. So we get it very hard. So I'm just asking for the people who want to help the communities, not mine, any other community, because we are many. Let the 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 language be simple to them so that they can fill the form what you want but those the the the, the complicated the uh, english there makes us to lose a lot thank you okay a few reflections uh very Briefly, um, so on, on PPPs and, and, and nature-based solutions, look, I think we all know that getting private sector investment in adaptation is, we haven't cracked that nut. I mean, we're look, you know, we're, we have some pilots, we're looking at land value capture and urban resilience and, you know, a little bit maybe some private investment in kind of smart agriculture, but it's, 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 we need to do more and I will honestly say the World Bank hasn't cracked that nut. We're, we're looking at it, we clearly need more investment in adaptation and we're getting right now, public financing is not going to do it by itself. 
Um, and, and again, we need everyone in this room and, and, and outside of this room to think this one through and, and, and just keep pushing that, that agenda. Um, on the conflict uh, question, I, I think, look, I think uh, let's also not, it's, countries in conflict are not one big homogenous group, you know? so there's a, there's a lot of variety there. So for instance, I can tell you from the Afghanistan experience that we did a lot of work through the National Solidarity program which is a large CDD program that reaches most of the most of the different regions in Afghanistan to mainstream uh, climate adaptation with, you know in that program so there, there are ways that you can do that um, then in the last couple of years I've been working on South Sudan and Somalia and then you get into really complex situations where you know Somalia that's in arrears right hasn't paid its international debts for for many years um, and we you know a lot of lobbying we managed to get them access to the crisis response window uh, which then sort of went straight down to ICRC who's the only organization working in al shabaab controlled area so it's it's complicated and then when you get to the South Sudan look I mean, it is, it, not only is it unsafe for our own staff to be on the ground, um, you know, the money just goes, so little of it gets to the people that really need it. And then we've heard so many stories in the last year, for example, of beneficiaries who did receive aid um, getting targeted, you know, in violent attacks because they were beneficiaries of the aid. So. So, you know, it's, it's in the World Bank, I have to tell you, it started a whole sort of soul searching on what are we doing here? Are we doing more harm than good? Um, and again, this is, this is private within these walls, but, um, but anyway. So, so I think, uh, you know, we're looking at creating new mechanisms, you know, as I said, there's the crisis response she window, we all do IDAT, and there is you know, a new mechanism we're setting up on looking at famines, like a famine response mechanism, or at least a famine, uh, so some of the mechanisms we can get in before the famine um, take, you know, takes effect, um, but it's it's difficult. But again, I want to just emphasize that there are, you know, you've got the Yemens and the South Sudans, and then you've got, you know, the Madagascars and the, and the Afghanistans, and they're all considered FCD countries, but, you know, there's actually a lot we can do in many of them. Um, and then just finally, I want to pick up on, and I'm not taking too much time, but I want to pick up on this issue Someone said, let's not get hung up on climate finance. And I just really want to endorse that. I mean, I know the 100 billion is really important, and I know it's about climate justice. So we can't let that piece go. But the truth is, there is a lot of finance out there. There's development finance out there. And we need to use every dollar of development finance and make it climate smart. And that's how the World Bank can make a commitment that you know between 2020 and 2025, we're going to put $200 billion in climate um, action. And that's because we're using our development dollars in a climate smart way. And, and I think, you know, again, that's, the conversation needs to get out there and really start thinking about, you know, whatever we do, whatever public uh, investment is made in any of our countries needs to be climate smart and needs to be, you know, climate adaptive. Um, and, and that way we can really get those numbers up. Because $100 billion is nothing. I mean, you know, the adaptation needs in the developing world, forget about, you know, rich countries, but in the developing world are so big and they're only growing that 100 billion a year is just not, is a drop in the ocean. So anyway, that's what I'm, I, I, I just want to endorse that because absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess as always in the group DNC days, uh, the final conversation is the start of the conversation rather than the complete answer. Um, I was thinking, um, uh, also as we were rounding off with, with your feet being put, put to the fire, actually a pretty honest, grounded, yet ambitious answer. Uh, I was thinking um, one of my first days when I was at the World Bank in Washington, uh, they had a take your daughters to, to work day. So the big World Bank action, this giant, you know, building made to look uh, impressive. There were all these young girls lining up in it. They could ask, take your kids, that's both, okay. And they could, they could line up to ask a question at that time of, of uh, President Wolfenstein. So he was there in a giant auditorium with all these, these World Bank staff, of course, coming to look at the spectacle. And there's a little girl walking up to the stage. And, Hi, I'm Laura, I'm six years old. And Mr. Wolfenstein, I want to know from you, how old are you? <laughs> And then the second came up and said, remember what the name was, and, hi, I'm so-and-so, I'm five years old, and I want to know, how are you going to save the rhino? 
And I think we're in a sort of position where we're asking, World Bank, how are you going to save the planet from climate change? And I think we should not ask you to provide a simple answer. But actually, an answer that is both ambitious, does look at these, these big questions of these different types of finance, but also connects to the sort of stories that we were hearing here. I, I felt that in this panel, we, we were sensing some of that connection. So I think that is a tribute to you, but also to the other panelists and, and to this community. I think it's also a challenge for us to continue to do that going forward, um, to, to, to create that connectivity, to also bring our experiences make our arguments in ways that, that allow us to, to, to make these things work together. And it's not, not always easy. And it, it also requires us to look critically at our own evidence, what is working, what is not working, um, and to look critically at the way in which um, we engage in, in these global, global processes, including the opportunities, especially in the coming year. Um, so I want to uh, hand over to Celine, but at least from my side, already a big appreciation of this special panel. Uh, to the panel and to all of you, especially those of you who spent two days with us. Uh, my final two cents were uh, um, this uh, Development Climate Day started many years ago as an adaptation day and then became a two day event, which I started a long time ago. But it's actually paired with an annual event called the International Conference on Community Based Adaptation, which we actually do on the ground. Uh, we did the 12th in that series in Malawi earlier this year. The next one is going to be in Ethiopia from the 1st to the 4th of April. I invite any of you who are interested, I know many of you are also associated with that, that links the, the local and, and constants of with us in Malawi uh, with the global here at the DNC days. In fact, the two meetings are structured to make that linkage through the meetings themselves. And I think that the meeting here uh, achieved that purpose of having these conversations across these scales of global to global. Uh, Having said that, I'm going to just share my own personal reflection, this being my 24th COP, on where we are in terms of the evolution of thinking and, and particularly on adaptation in particular. I think we are re reaching a, a very high level of consensus at both the global and the local, and we are identifying the problems and we want to solve them, we want to find the, the solutions to them. And I'll, I'll give you my two cents of what I think the solutions are. The three main solutions are capacity building, capacity building, capacity building, okay? And I differentiate them. Capacity building number one is for the global donors, the GCF, the World Bank, to understand how do you reach the, the most vulnerable. They don't know. They need to learn. Secondly, national governments, both how to get the money, but then how to get the money once they've got it to the local level. Again, they're not very good at that. And then the third is obviously the communities themselves, who are doing a lot on their own, but cannot do everything on their own. They need to be assisted and empowered and, and enabled. All of this is a long-term agenda for capacity building, which is what I do, and that's why I like capacity building. Uh, so uh, I'll leave you with that thought and hand over to Claire. You're going to do the honors to close us.